الہی اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و مولانا ابی القاسم المصطفی محمد اللہم صلی اللہ علی محمد وعالی محمد وعلى آلہ بیت الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین لا سیما بقیت اللہ فی الارضین روحی ورواح العالمین لہ الفداح رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی عمری وحل لقتکم من لسانی یفقہ قولی So we begin tonight doing what we do every Muharram. We know that we are the soldiers of Imam al-Mahdi and we know that we have to use this opportunity when our hearts are softer than they normally are during the year to better ourselves and to change ourselves. And they become those soldiers of the Mahdi. We know that our Imam is waiting on us. When we get ourselves together, when we decide that enough is enough, the Imam will return. There's a question that might come to mind when we talk about things like soldiers, being soldiers and getting ready for the war. And that is that, are we saying that this is male dominated? That the sisters don't have a role, for instance? Soldiers, right? Battlefield, you know, we think of military training and stuff like that. But actually what we're talking about is something different than that. It's even mentioned in the ahadith which talk about the 313 that some of them are women. So when we're talking about being a soldier of the Imam or preparing ourselves to serve the Imam and give that ultimate sacrifice, that's true for both brothers and sisters. The wish for shahada and the way of Allah is supposed to be there in our brothers and our sisters. The wish to serve God and be a slave and an abd of God for brothers and sisters. A lot of the duties which I'll be talking about for our soldiers of the Mahdi are common and shared between brothers and sisters. But there is a difference. Even in those ahadith which talk about the women who are in the army of the Mahdi and many of them they mention that the role of women is different than the role of men. We're Muslims, we don't apologize for being different. We're not trying to fit into the West. We're not begging them to accept us. We're not trying to say, we're just like you. We believe that actually the roles of men and women are different. And if others haven't understood that yet, then that's their problem. Right? Sorry, right? but that's the way it is. So it's not that men and women are less than men or men, no. But the roles are different, yes. Maybe they are very quick to send their women off into various countries to fight and use them, but we have a little honor, a little ghayra, we protect our women. We want, if it's necessary to defend themselves, they will. But we prefer that our guys go and they sacrifice themselves. Our women have another role to play. But the readiness is there in everybody. So somebody might call you old-fashioned, they might say, how can you believe that men and women are equal? Get them out there on the battlefield, having them walking around with machine guns. Tell them, no, we're different. We're not old-fashioned, we're old school. So having said that, now we want to get back to our own discussion, which is that we are actually going to talk about Surah Yusuf over the course of these nights. And we know that Surah Yusuf is talking about a position a slave who's reached the position of being one of the mukhlasin. But for us, what's interesting is that we're using this surah so that we can become among the mukhlasin, those people who are purified by God, even higher than mukhlasin. How we're going to do that is that we have to take practical steps in Irfan. There's Irfan, which is amali, it's practical, steps that we have to take. So we're not limiting ourselves to the bare minimum this Muharram. When we're looking at this story, which is talking about one of the mukhlasin, we're looking to see what isharat are there in the tafsir. And we're using, for the majority of our work, we're using the tafsir of Al-Mizan, which was written by Allama Taba Tabai, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala Alayh. And he has some very beautiful points in there that we will try to use to 
make this verse of Quran, these verses, be talking to us. We're not just here to get more information. We may have a lot of information about Islam. Our problem, the reason the Imam's not here, is not only a lack of information. The Imam sees that a lack of action sometimes. The amal needs to change. We need to better ourselves. So that's what we're looking for in our thing. So, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. We start off with the beginning of the surah. Alif lam ra tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. Alif lam ra, those are the signs of a book made clear. First, we'll start off with alif lam ra. These are what is called, they're what, what is called al-huruf al-muqatta'ah. And there's a lot of discussion that is found in tafsir about these verses or about these letters. Alamu Tabai in his tafsir on Surah Yusuf doesn't explain, doesn't elaborate on his position on al-huruf al-muqatta'ah in this surah. Where does he do it? He does it in another surah, surah number 49, surah Ashura. There he explains. He says that when you look in the Holy Quran, you find that the words, these huruf al huruf al muqatta, when you look at the surahs that have them, the surahs that resemble one another, when it comes to those first few letters, he says the content of those surahs is similar. The content of those surahs is similar. But what are the huruf? He says that what they are is. Rumuz khafiya. These are hidden secrets between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. And he says that we don't have access to these meanings, the meanings behind these huruf through normal means. With the, just the human intellect? No, we're not. We're not capable of finding out all of those secrets. Those are secrets between Allah and His beloved. But we know that the meanings of those surahs, the contents of those surahs, is similar. So that's the first part. The second one is, we continue with the verse, Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. Those, those verses, are the signs of a book that makes clear. The Quran is al mubin. It makes other things clear. It is clear in and of itself. The Quran is clear. In addition to the Quran being clear, it makes other things clear. In the Holy Quran, what we find are al ma'arif al ilahiya, the divine sciences. Allah describes Himself to us in the Quran. There is a beautiful hadith that I don't understand. To be honest with you, I don't understand the hadith. It just gives us an idea of what we're talking about when we're looking at the Quran. Let me just translate the, the book of the hadith for you, and then we'll see if we can understand anything from it. But believe me, this is a, a lofty hadith. The hadith says that Allah manifested himself, tajalla, manifested himself in the Holy Quran. He showed himself to his creation in the Quran. What we're trying to do over the course of these nights and over our lives as Muslims is to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eyes of the heart. We're trying to purify ourselves, to remove these veils, to worship Allah without veils, and then to see God. Not with these eyes, though, with the eyes of the heart. So the hadith says that Allah showed himself, manifested himself in the Holy Quran. So the Quran is a book that makes things clear, and most importantly to all of us, makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes him somebody we can see, understand, th learn things about. But over in the, the Quran, when we say it makes things clear, it does not mean that there's no need for the sunnah. The Quran, the role that the Quran, it makes things clear. It's similar to a constitution. The Quran, you don't find all of the details of the Sharia in the Quran. You find some of the details, Allah, the majority of the details you find in the Sunnah, the bylaws, the clauses, where does this rule stop? Where does this rule apply to? 
if we try to approach the Quran and think, well, the Quran makes things clear, I have no need for the Sunnah, then first of all, we're going against Quran, I'll read you the verse. In addition to going against Quran, we're not going to understand the Quran properly. We want to understand the Quran when we have a, take a meaning from the Quran. We want to understand the Quran in the context of the other verses. And also, we want to look to see what's in the Sunnah and what they've said about certain things. So the Quran itself is clear, but take that example, which actually is not from me. This is from Alama Tabatabai, Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alayhi. He says, look at the Quran like a constitution. Those general principles are there. The rules, and they're very clear. We use the Quran as a measuring stick, even when it comes to a hadith. We weigh them against the Holy Quran. Anything which conflicts with the Quran, we reject, right? But does that mean every little detail is in the Holy Quran? We have no need now for Sunnah. It's clear. It's enough. No, that's against the Holy Quran. I'll read you the verse. This is found in the Surah 16 and verse number 44. Wa anzalna ilayka dhikr. We, Allah is speaking, we have sent down for you the reminder. Talking to who? The Prophet. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ In order that you explain to the people that which has been revealed to them. The Prophet, there's a role for the Prophet. He's supposed to go over and explain those details. Tell us how the Qur'an applies. We cannot take the Qur'an and think, oh, well, it's clear, I don't need the Sunnah. No, that's a big mistake. Of course, the Holy Prophet has told us this. And we find it in those ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt. One of them, which you all know, inni tarakun fikum al-thaqalain ma in tamasaktun bihima lan tadillu. I have left two weighty things amongst you. One of them is kitab Allah, and the other is itrati. So we need both in order to understand the Quran and the teachings of the Quran fully. The Quran is clear, but it's given us instructions on how to understand it and use it to apply to us. Otherwise, let's say we didn't take this Quranic advice and we just said that we'll just use the Quran. The Quran is enough. We can make a big mistake and sometimes it'll lead to a catastrophe trying to understand the Quran without Sunnah. And what we mean by Sunnah, the words of the Prophet, the actions of the Prophet, and also after the Prophet, his progeny. Let me give you one example and we'll move on. This verse is found in Surah 6, and it's verse number 106. You probably might know the meaning of the verse. I'll recite it for you. Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amthaliha. You know what that means? Whoever comes with man ja'a bil hasana, whoever does some good deeds, falahu ashru amthaliha. You'll get 10 times that reward. وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيَّعَ Whoever commits a sin, فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ You'll not be mistreated. You only get that one thing that you did. So a man tried to understand this without the help of the sunnah. They came to Imam Sadiq and they told him that there's this wonderful guy, this individual, he's a great guy, and this guy, everybody wants to learn from him, they're benefiting from him, they're benefiting from him. From what I remember the hadith, they were calling him Allama, not Alim, Allama. This guy understands so much. The Imam says, I became curious to see the guy. Who is this guy? So he said he went over and he saw people around this guy, everybody milling around him, and the guy was like trying to move away from them, perhaps quite piously holding on to his abba, for instance, moving. So the imam's watching him, everybody's gathered around him, and the guy started to walk away. The imam says, I followed him. The guy walked until he went into a store. And there he waited, got the owner of the store busy, and then he took two fruit, tucked them into his shirt, and he went. Then he, the Imam, a lama, this great guy, started following him, he went somewhere else, guy was selling bread, waited, the guy's not looking, takes out the abba or whatever, slips it in, and he goes. 
Then after that, he walks into a house and there's some fuqara in the house. And he takes out that fruit and the bread and he starts to give it away. And the Imam says, no, he, I had enough. I stopped him. I said, brother, what are you doing? He said that, first of all, tell me who you are. So the Imam explained his lineage, I'm Jafar. He said, oh, you're the son of the Prophet and you don't know the Quran? I don't know the Quran. He said, brother, if I, commit a, if, I commit a good, if I do a good deed, how many rewards do I get from the Holy Quran? Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru I get two, ten good deeds for every thing. And if I commit a sin, one sin. He said, so what I did was I gave away that fruit, I got 40 good deeds, then you subtract from that, do the math, Imam, you take away the four bad deeds, how many good deeds are you left? Then he says, huh? Man janat al-hasna sabaq Allah al-ali al-ati. So the man stopped him, bro. No, it doesn't work like that. Other verses of the Quran. So what happens if we want to just go to the Quran? It's clear. I don't need any help. It's against that ayat of Quran. And sometimes it becomes a real catastrophe. We don't want to do that. Get one verse of Quran and go crazy. So we don't do that. Back to our verse. Alif Lam Ra Tilka Ayatul Kitab al Mubin. Alif Lam Ra, those are the signs of the book that makes clear. The word here, Tilka, it's what we call Ismul Ishara. It's a demonstrative pronoun. Now, in the Arabic language, they use Tilka to refer to something that's far away. That, those. And they use hadihi for something that's close. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's talking about the Holy Quran, which is close to us, but he says, tilka, those ayat. So a question might come to mind, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did he say that? Those verses of the Quran are close to us. Why would he say tilka and refer to those ayats which are so far away? Did God forbid Allah make a mistake? You guys don't believe that, right? But they say, Naqlul kufr laysa bi kufr. They said that there was a woman who had a heart attack. Middle-aged woman. She had a heart attack. She had a heart attack and she was in the hospital. It was not a true story. Naqlul kufr laysa bi kufr. On the heart attack, she's laying on the thing. She starts to talk to God. God, is this it? He says, no, it's not it. You got, you know, X many years. And she's like, oh, great. So she went over and she had a tummy tuck and, you know, got her face done, everything all right. You know, alhamdulillah. She came out of the hospital and then a car hit her. And she went to heaven. She was like, God, I thought I had, you know, 40 more years. And God was like, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. So we don't believe those kind of things. Allah didn't make a mistake. There must be a nukta, a point. There's a reason. Why would God say tilka? when those verses are right there. Now what they tell us is that tilka lil makana, la lil makan. That when Allah is referring to those verses of the Quran as being far away, he's trying to show us the makana, the position, the status of those verses. Not makan, he's not trying to show us where the verses are. The status of those verses. The Quran, he's showing us the adama of the Quran, the greatness of the Holy Quran. How important the Quran is supposed to be to us. Tilka Ayatul Kitab al Mubin. The greatness of the Holy Quran. So that shows us the status that the Quran is supposed to have in our lives. And unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes the Quran doesn't hold that status in our lives. Be honest with one another. I'm talking about myself first. Talking about myself first. But you know, as soldiers of the Mahdi, we have hadith. This is from Imam al-Mahdi. He's talking about why the ghaybah is delayed. Hadith now. فَمَا يَحْبِسُنَا عَنْهُمْ إِلَّا مَا يَتَسِلُ بِنَا مِمَّا نَكْرَهُهُ وَلَا نُؤْثِرُهُ مِنْهُمْ the only reason that our delay, our return is delayed, and we don't are not there with our Shia, 
are those actions of theirs, those things that the Shias do, which we nakrahuhu, we don't like. Kirahat, we don't like those things. We don't prefer that they do those things. They do those things and that information comes back to the Imam. And he sees that no, his soldiers aren't ready. So that's what we're here to do this Muharram. We're here to change those things. So the first thing we want to get from this verse, we realize that this verse is showing us that the Quran is supposed to be very important in our eyes. And the eyes of the soldier of the Mahdi, the Quran is supposed to be extremely important, extremely lofty. We don't take the Quran lightly. When it's talking about this in the Holy Quran, the importance, the place that the Quran holds is what Allah says. This is in Surah 59 and verse number 21. If we sent down this Quran on a mountain, you see that the mountain would crumble out of humility before God. A mountain. The mountains, we describe them as being unconquerable, dominant. If the Quran was revealed to a mountain, it would crumble. So that's the position of the Quran. The Quran is that important, that weighty. But we have to realize and admit to ourselves that no, and I'll give some examples, the Quran does not occupy that place in our hearts that it should. Because if we don't admit it to ourselves, if we tell ourselves, well, no, we're all right, we, we're doing everything great. I mean, the Mahdi, why, why is he waiting? His soldiers are here. The hadith is from Imam Baqir. He says that no one escapes from the sin except the person who admits to the sin. If I refuse to tell myself that no, I don't respect the Quran as I should, I'm never going to get over this problem. This, the hadith. Wallah, the Imam swearing by Allah. Wallah, ma yanju min al illa min bih. I want to better myself. I want to change myself. I want to become a true soldier of Imam Mahdi. The first thing is to be honest with myself and admit that no, I've got problems. I've got issues. I'm not where I ought to be. One of the things is that I don't hold the Quran in that position that it should have. Now you might ask yourself, how dare you say that we don't hold the Quran? How do you know? I'm talking to myself first, but then also you guys. If we really held the Quran in its position, do you think it's possible that the Imam could have this many Shias all over the world and not return? If we are ready, there's more than 313 of us, right? There's more than the other 10,000. There's still a problem, though. If we held the Quran in that position that it was supposed to occupy, the Imam would be here. So we know for sure that's not the case. We have to worry about this verse of the Quran. It's a little bit scary. It's um, Surah 25 and verse 30. وَقَالَ rasul. The Prophet will complain on the Day of Judgment, based on what I remember. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا The Prophet will complain on the Day of Judgment and say that Allah, my Lord, my people abandoned the Qur'an. They did not take the Qur'an seriously. They abandoned the Holy Qur'an. So we want to give some examples to see what it's like, what we should be like as the soldiers of Imam Mahdi. How should we be when it comes to the Holy Quran? Because we have a beautiful hadith, again, explaining to this the importance of the Holy Quran, the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He's explaining the importance of the Holy Quran. This is, what he, this is the, the words of the Prophet. Kitabullah sababun. The book of Allah is a sabab, it's a heavy rope. Tarafuhu biyadillah. One part of that rope is in God's hands. Wa tarafuhu bi'aydikum. The other part is in your hands. Fatamassaku bih. So hold fast to the Quran. We're not doing that. Let me give you an example of someone who did hold fast to the Quran. Someone who took the Quran seriously, who's not masum. Inspiration for all of us. 
One example is Imam Khomeini. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Okay? Let me just give you an example. Again, when we hear what Imam Khomeini did, Imam Khomeini is an Arif, Imam Khomeini reached so many stages of Tawheed, we're not going to say that, okay, I'm going to do exactly what Imam Khomeini did, but I just want to tell you what we can be doing to then say, okay, well now what is our taklif and what is our duty? So Imam Khomeini didn't just give slogans and shout and talk. He didn't walk, he didn't talk the talk, he walked the walk, Imam Khomeini. Let me give you an example. During the month of Ramadan, when Imam Khomeini was in Najaf, he used to com complete the entire Quran from cover to cover once every three days. In the month of Ramadan, once every three days, Imam Khomeini would read the Quran from cover to cover. Later, when Imam Khomeini was older and his health wasn't as good, he used to, in the month of Ramadan, he would complete it once every 10 days in the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is the, the, the month of the Quran. We're supposed to be reciting Quran. Imam Khomeini used to always have the Quran next to him. They said that during the rest of the year, Imam Khomeini would divide the, um, he would complete the Quran once a month. Okay, so the month of Ramadan in Najaf every three days. Later in Jamaran, he would complete it every 10 days during the month of Ramadan. But for the rest of the year, what was Imam Khomeini's program like? They said that Imam Khomeini would complete the Quran once every month. Once a month, he would finish the entire Quran. He would divide a 30th, a juz, into eight parts. And he would read it over different parts of the day. For instance, before his daily prayers, Imam Khomeini reading Quran. Before Salatul Layl, Imam Khomeini reading Quran. Sometimes before he would eat food, Imam Khomeini reading Quran. This is an example of someone who takes the Quran seriously. But we, won't, we don't want to think, oh, Imam Khomeini was speed reading. Just get the Quran, just blow right through the Quran. No, Imam Khomeini would ponder over it. Sometimes he would spend a lot of time on one particular verse. And again, at Imam Khomeini's level, right, of understanding someone, mujtahid, marja, when he reads the Quran and what he understands in the Quran, but still with that, sometimes he would pause over those verses of the Holy Quran. They said once Imam Khomeini's eyes were bothering him. So he went to a doctor. And the doctor advised him, he said that, um, just stop reading the Quran for a few days so your eyes can recover. Imam Khomeini laughed. He said, I want eyes so I can read Quran. You're telling me to stop reading Quran? So that's an example of someone who takes the Quran seriously. But now, let's say that we want to be soldiers of Imam al-Mahdi. We want to better ourselves. We want to have the Quran be part of our daily lives. What should we do? Where do we start? How much Quran should we read? The first thing, these are now practical Irfani steps, okay? For those of us who say that from this Muharram onward, I want to do something that makes the Imam ready. I'm not just trying to be a bare minimum Muslim. I want to be a soldier of the Mahdi. I need to be reading Quran. How much of Quran? They tell us that ideally, 20 verses of the Holy Quran daily. And not just my favorite surah that I pick up Surah Yasin and I read that, you know, zzz, alhamdulillah, next. No. Cover to cover. Start on one side and then move to the other side, reading the Quran. 20 verses of the Holy Quran. Gradually, once I get comfortable with that, then I'm going to add on 10 more verses and 10 more till I get to 50. Because we have hadith. This is from Imam Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Imam says that the mu'min is supposed to be reading 50 ayat daily. 50 ayat of the Holy Quran if we want to be those soldiers. But now shaitan comes in. Shaitan will, he talks to me a lot, okay? So I'll just, it's okay to hear the words of shaitan. They're coming through a translator, okay? Bro, you know that you're not going to read 20 verses of the Holy Quran, right? Yeah. Okay. So, give it up. Yeah. You can't do it. You can't do 20. Give it up. But we have to tell shaitan, right? And we're going to start somewhere. 
some verses of the Holy Quran. I can do one page. I can do five verses, something. But I've got to start having the Holy Quran be in my life. One other thing, though. We only, if we're going to be reading them, when we look for the spiritual instructions, they say, ponder over one verse. Right? Sometimes what happens, I want to start reading the Quran. Okay, now, and I read those hadith. If you don't do tadabbar in the Quran, there's no benefit. So now I'll start reading 20 verses, for instance, and try and ponder over each one of those verses. It becomes very heavy. But we want, these are lifelong skills we want to adopt during this month of Muharram. So first of all, from those teachers of akhlaq, they tell us one verse. Ponder over one verse. If we can do the 20, wonderful, we've started. If we can't do the 20, something, one page, one verse, two verses, five verses, we can do something. But the Quran needs to come into our lives. Another point now, this is from the leader of the revolution, okay? Because we're talking about being soldiers of the Imam. The leader explained an experience he had. He said, I tested people who read the Quran more. When it came to those who were struggling in the way of Allah, who were able to continue on the path, he said those people who used to have a small copy of the Quran with them, and they would take a few minutes, maybe standing, inshallah, Allah will give tawfiq to all of you to do ziyara of Imam al-Rida in Iran, inshallah. In Iran, one of the things that they have is these bakeries, the same way they do it in the other places in the Middle East, bakeries. So you're standing in the bakery, you got a few minutes, you take out your Quran, you start to read it. He said that those people who would have that little copy of the Quran with them, read it whenever they got an opportunity. He said these people were much more effective for the cause. These people had greater determination. These people had a deeper understanding and they were much more attached than others. The other thing that we get, this is again from the leader, is that the effect that the Quran has on you is gradual. It's like water. You need it. You keep needing to replenish yourself, replenish yourself. And the effect that you're going to get from the Quran is gradual. One other thing to keep in mind about these, the spiritual instructions of the Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes it might seem a little bit hard for us in the beginning when we start adopting these principles. But if we give it a little while, it will become sweet to us. We'll adopt it. We'll enjoy it. And this is not something theoretical. Okay, well, that's great. I've learned that now. No, you've got to experience this. Take the Quran, read a little bit of Quran, see what it does for you, ponder over only one verse. You might want to do more than that. Stop yourself. One verse. Ponder over that. Read the Quran and see what effect it has. So that's our first lesson. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Alif lam ra tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. Alif Lam Ra, those are the signs of the book that makes clear. The second lesson, the first one was that we believe that the Quran is important, that we read the Quran, that it's part of our daily lives. The second one is now Amal. We've got to act according to the Quran. We've got to make sure that our wajibat, those things that the Quran said, we're doing. It's impossible. For me to say, I have great respect for the Holy Quran, but God told me in the Quran not to do this, and I do whatever I want. And I don't feel ashamed about it. I'm not talking about the super high, wajibat. I'm not praying, but yet the Quran is very lofty and very important in my eyes. The Quran says pray. I'm not praying. I'm not fasting. I'm not wearing hijab. I'll wear hijab when I'm old and gray. Job's not for when you're old and gray, it's for when you're young and cute. That's what you're supposed to wear. <laughs> so I'm not praying, I'm not fasting. God forbid I'm, you know, sometimes got Muslim were gamblers, professional. <laughs> and Quran is against these things. I, obviously, I can't be, you know, saying I'm, I have great respect for the Quran. If we are like that, we have to change ourselves. It doesn't mean we don't have any belief. We do have belief. But our practice is not as strong as it should be. One thing we want to be careful about is we don't want to become professional sinners. Right? There's some sinners that are rookies, and there's others that are professional. We don't want to become professional sinners when it comes to violating the laws of Allah. I'll give you an example. This happened in the Islamic Republic, okay? Islamic Republic. 
This thief broke into a house, okay? He stole everything in the house, and they ended up catching the thief afterwards. So the guy, whose house it was, they ended up catching him. He goes to the police station and talks to him. He said, I want to talk to this guy. He said, there's one thing that I can't figure out for the life of me. He said that this guy stole the rug that I was sleeping on when I was still asleep. <laughs> Professional singer. I was asleep, my wife was asleep, we're on the rug, and this guy got us all, how did he do it? And the professional sinner. Guy started to explain. He said, what I did was, I saw you guys were sleeping, and I laid down in between you guys on the rug. Ice water runs through this guy's veins. He said, I started to bump you a little bit, then I bumped your wife. Bump you, bump your wife. Bump you, bump your wife. Get up, roll that up, put that bad boy on my shoulder, I'm out the house. That's a professional. And sometimes, God forbid, we can become professionals when it comes to violating Allah's laws. It gets good to us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so we don't want to do, become professional sinners. If we consider the Quran important, the first step on the spiritual path is that I've got to do the wajibat. Got to make sure that the basics, I've got those covered. There are other instructions, though, from the Holy Quran, which all of us have to be implementing, especially if we want to be those soldiers of the Imam. Because we're now talking about being among the elite, not just being a regular, everyday Muslim, but one of the elite. One of those verses that's talking about respect of the Holy Quran, instructions of the Holy Quran, I take them seriously. One of them we find in Surah 59, and it's verse number 18. This is Allah talking to us. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ittaqullah. O you who have faith, beware of God. Be God wary. Feel sense that you're in God's presence, that he's watching you. The verse continues. Wal tandur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad. That every soul needs to consider what it sends ahead for tomorrow. What taqullah, be wary of, of Allah, inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amalun. God is indeed well aware of what you do. This is talking again about another one of those spiritual wajibat. Spiritual wajibat. One of the spiritual wajibat, which is being referred to, we find in this verse, verses like this, is the concept of al-muhasaba. Another one of those spiritual wajibat. Without this, we're not going to get anywhere. What is the concept of al-muhasaba? The same thing that the verse is saying. I have to look at what I'm sending forward for tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day of judgment when Allah takes me into account. In order to succeed spiritually, I need to take account of myself. Count what I'm doing right, count what I'm doing wrong. Let me give you another one of those hadith that's talking about it. This is from Imam al-Radha, alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, Laysa minna. For those people who have dreams of being the elite soldiers of the Imam, spiritual wajibat. Laysa minna man lam yuhasib nafsahu fi kulli yawm. The one who does not take account of himself on a daily basis is not from us. These advice that first are for me and then for you, they're to help us better ourselves. Otherwise, I'll tell you, let me tell you the problem and be a little bit frank with you. A lot of times we have religious individuals, sometimes even revolutionary individuals, they've understood the message of Imam Khomeini, they've read books, they're performing the wajibat, but then you see in the Islamic centers, when you want to do Islamic work with these same individuals, because this inner dimension hasn't been worked on, the same individuals destroy one another. Jealousy. Sometimes you go to some of the centers, it's like, you've seen sumo wrestlers? Sumo wrestlers? Big, heavy Japanese guys? Right? The centers are like that big, arguing, fighting Muslims. People are practicing. 
because it was only the outer shell, which is very important, basic wajibat, everybody has to do that. But if we don't take account of ourselves, if we don't find out what we're doing wrong, find out our sins, our problems, our issues, don't write them down and then work to remove them, we're building a castle on sand. To do real work for the imam, you gotta dig deep. One of them is this spiritual wajibat that I just mentioned. So, we have to do this muhasaba. Let me give you a few hadith which are talking about its importance, and then after that, some practical instructions when it comes to this muhasaba. The first one is from the Prophet Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He's speaking to Abu Dhar. He says, Ya Abu Dhar, la yakun ar-rajul min al-muttaqeen hatta yuhasiba nafsah. O Abu Dhar, you will not be considered one of the muttaqeen, one of the god wary until you perform al-muhasaba. You've got to do this, spiritual wajibah. For those who are looking for more from Islam, who want to experience the goodly life, who want to get them up to the maqam of ikhlas and then khulus. But he says, حَتَّى يُحَاسِبَ نَفْسَهُ أَشَدَّ مِن مُحَاسَبَةِ الشَّرِيكَ شَرِيكَهِ Sometimes you've got two business partners, and now you want to balance the books. You want to see where every penny went to. You guys have pennies in Australia? Okay. Something similar. You want to go over and find out where the money went to. How do you find out? You sit down, you go over the books, he takes his thing, you take your thing. Okay, well, where do you, where'd you spend this? Okay, and where's this money? Which account? You take account of those things. He says you have to be more severe, ashad, right? Then how, if you're with a business partner, you're making sure the business is running tight, your account and wherever, you're balancing the books, then with yourself, you've got to be even tougher, he says. He continues, though. He says, fayalama min ain mat'amuhu. He finds out, where is my food from? Wa min ain mashabuhu. What about my drinks and my food? And he continues. When it comes to my personal life, I want to be a soldier of Imam al Mahdi. Is my income halal? The clothes that I'm wearing, am I wearing clothes that I'm supposed to? And I'm doing what God wants me to do? Even he's giving examples of food and drink. So if we're talking about food and drink, that I want to, at the end of the day, okay, what did I drink today? Did I eat this? Did I do this? What else? The other actions, how I was with my mother, my father, brother, sisters, wife, husband, all of that, food even. One more. This one is from a middle mu'mineen, Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. A man came to him. He said, how do we do this? Ya middle mu'mineen. How do we do this muhasaba? How does a man do muhasaba? Man or woman do muhasaba of himself? This is what the Imam says. What you tell your nafs. Today passed. You tell yourself this. This day is never coming back. You don't get a chance to relive your days. وَاللَّهُ يَسْأَلُكِ عَنْهُ بِمَا أَفْنَيْتِهِ He says that Allah will ask you how you spent this day. Tell yourself this. He says, <clears throat> فَمَا الَّذِي عَمِلْتِ فِيهِ What did you do in this day? This is what you're doing at the end of the day, and I'll talk about how to actually do this. At the end of the day, when you're talking about, and the Imam mentions this, he says in the beginning of the day, towards the end of the day, you're starting to perform this, you start to talk, talk to your nafs and be severe with your nafs, more than you are with your business partner. He says that you ask the nafs, adhakarti Allah, using the female pronoun because he's talking to the nafs, the nafs is female, meaning in Arabic. He says, did you remember Allah, am hamidtihi? Did you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's supposed to be a certain part of our day where we actually praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's mentioned in the hadith that remembering Allah is not only saying subhanallah and alhamdulillah and la ilaha illallah. The imam says that it's remembering Allah when it comes to halal and haram. 
That's when you know if you remember Allah. There's an example they give. They said that there was this man on the bus. And unfortunately, this guy had a bad habit. He used to look at women. Okay? But he was doing vicar also. Vicar. This guy, none of you guys are like this. I'm telling you for myself, right? This guy, he would sit there and he would do the tasbih. So if he saw a girl who was really good looking, he'd be like, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, he'd be looking into her eyes, Alhamdulillah, then if she wasn't so pretty, he'd be like, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> this other guy was on the bus and he was looking at him, and he was watching this guy. So he came up to him and he's like, one Alhamdulillah just passed. <laughs> so not that kind of dhikr. Dhikr when it comes to wajib, what's wajib? When it comes to times when my faith is tested, when I have to stand up for my religion and do what's right, do I do it? Do I remember Allah when it comes to halal and haram? But they're also dhikr. But that's at a later stage where we'll actually get dhikr that we're supposed to perform, all of us. So he says, then he can, starts to go on to the social relationships of the mu'min with other mu'mineen. Aqadayti hawa'aj a mu'minin fi. Did you meet the needs of any other mu'min in this day? You're talking to yourself at the end of the day. Did you meet the needs of any other mu'min in this day? When nafaste anhu karba, sometimes you see a mu'min who's going through some difficulty, problems, depressed, sad. It doesn't take much to go over, sit down with the person, smile at the person, ask them how the day is, try and resolve their problems. Am hafidhtihi bi al ghayb fi ahlihi wa wuldih. Sometimes a mu'min travels and is away from his family. Do you look out for his family at that time? You helping that other mu'min out? Mama's is continuing to get... What about the mu'min dies? And now he has inheritors. The Imam mentions this over. Also, he also talks about backbiting other mu'min. He says, Akathafti an ghaybati akhin mu'min. There was a mu'min brother or sister who was doing something that they shouldn't have, but it was done in secret. Am I, as a soldier of the Mahdi, spending time doing riba and backbiting this individual? The Imam continues. He says that if you helped a Muslim, and he continues, he says that if you remember any good that you've done, then at this stage, Hamidallah, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ala tawfiqih. That this person, if they see that they've done good, they praise Allah and they say that, Alhamdulillah, I had the tawfiq to do this good action. We count all of our deeds, even a small good deed, and we thank Allah for those individual good deeds. If we do that, we're told in the, we're told in the Holy Quran that if we thank Allah, Allah will increase us. What about if we see a mistake that we've made? If we see a taqseer, and this is the words of the hadith, istaghfar Allah. We don't lose hope, give up on ourselves. I'm a bad Muslim, Allah's written me off. No, we make a mistake, istighfar. We ask Allah to forgive us. Wa'azama ala tarkil mu'awada. After that, we intend never to return to the sin. So one of the spiritual wajibat, we've talked about several of them today, was this concept of al-muhasaba. This is necessary, this is one of those spiritual wajibat for those who want to go on the spiritual path. I want to take a step in practical irfan, get closer to my imam. I would like to get to the maqam of ikhlas, and then after that, khulus. One of the things I have to do is this concept of al-muhasaba. Now, sometimes what happens is that, because you do this in the end of the day, right? In the end of the day, before you go to bed, you do this. But what happens is that sometimes at the end of the day, I'm really tired. So I want to start doing al-muhasaba, right? End of the day, exhausted. Sometimes I go to bed really late, which is another mistake. Inshallah, we'll talk about that another time. We're supposed to be getting a certain amount of sleep as a soldier of Imam Mahdi. Your body has needs. So we're not supposed to be staying up until 3 o'clock in the morning and like, Inshallah, I'll get up for Fajr. Yeah, you know, if you're, you know, <laughs> Imam Khomeini. Otherwise, the rest of us, it's real tough. So getting enough sleep. But anyhow, at the end of the day, I'm tired, been working, going to school, whatever I'm doing, now I want to perform al-muhasaba. If I do it when I'm really dead exhausted, sometimes my mind will wander. I'll start doing al-muhasaba right in the middle. I'm going, knocked out, Mike Tyson. But if I start a little bit earlier in the day, 
Even break it up into two times a day. Break it up one time before, after law, for instance, if I have time there, or before, to break it up during the day and make it easier for myself. So I've done al muhasaba up until this part of the day. Now I'll restart my muhasaba, but then for this time from a second part. Also, another thing that makes it difficult is that our minds aren't trained to do this in the beginning, and our minds hop. We start counting our day, then our minds will skip. But if we continue to work at it, we'll get it eventually. So we take these three lessons from the verse, and we try and apply them to our personal lives, to become the soldiers of the imam. But now we'd like to remember our imam. We'd like to go back to Karbala. We'd like to see what those companions did, what our imam did in Karbala. I want you guys to say this with me if you don't mind. As-salamu ala al-Hussein Al-Hussein Wa ala Ali ibn al-Hussein Wa ala awlad al-Hussein Wa ala ashab al-Hussein We're going to go to Karbala and I want you guys to travel there with the, heart, the eyes of your hearts. Imagine that you're there, blood spattered on the plains of Karbala. Imagine that your father is there, standing there without enemies, without any friends. Imagine that you're watching your father, the imam of your time, more important than your father, struggle and go through this. I want to mention something that makes it a little bit more personal. Sometimes when you have a really close connection to somebody, let's say your parents, because this happened for my father, and inshallah have mercy on all of your parents. Sometimes when you're really close to somebody, you feel that person's pain. The imam is more than that. The imam feels your sickness. He feels your happiness. He feels your suffering. He feels what you're going through. And the imam felt each one of his companions die. He felt them die in Karbala. The imam is kinder than a mother is to you. And he would go over to each one of these companions. He would cry over them. One of the companions woke up and he saw that the imam was holding him. And he said, Man mithli, who is like me? Wa ibn Rasulullah, the son of the Prophet of Allah. Wa dhe'un khadahu ala khadhi. That the, the son of the Prophet of Allah is putting his cheek on my cheek. Who, am, who is luckier than I? The imam watched all of these people die. One by one he felt them die. So after that, when the imam was utterly alone, his companions had all been lost, then he watched his Ahlul Bayt go forward. And again, imagine what it feels like to lose a son if you have children. Imagine what it feels like to lose a brother if you have a brother. The imam watches them. He watches Ali Akbar go forward. He watches Qasim go forward. He watches Abbas go forward till finally the Imam is completely alone. At that stage, Nadar al Imam ila yaminihi wa yasarih. At that stage, the Imam started to look to the right and left. Nobody's left. He started to call out for help. Hal man da bin yadubbu an haram Rasulullah? Is there anybody to help us? Anybody to defend us? Imam Sajjad saw this, he saw that loneliness, the ghurbah of his father, and he came and he started to come out of the tent, dragging his sword, sick, trying to make it to assist his, his father. And the Imam gave the order for them to bring him back. The Imam gave salams to his family. He spoke to Zainab and Umm Kulthum. He spoke to them and he said to them, Salam. And the Imam began to walk towards the battlefield. As the Imam began to walk to the battlefield, he remembered he had a small son. 
He went back, he said, give me my son, give me my son. And he went over and he took this small child, this last sacrifice, and showed it to the people. He said, ya qawm, in lam tarhamuni farhamu hadha tifl. Oh people, if you're not going to have any mercy on me, then have mercy on this baby. Allah tarawna kayfa yataladha atasha. Do you not see how he is begging for water? And they answered the imam, with an arrow. We ask Allah by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, by the right of the Ahlul Bayt, that Allah accept our offering in these nights, that he makes us among the true soldiers of Imam al-Mahdi, that he helps us to perfect our faith, that he helps us to protect our faith, that he helps and protects all of the believers, all of the maraja, and especially the leader, Sayyid Ali Khamenei. Ilahi, Ilahi.